We're having a birthday party today, but instead of cake, we're serving raspberry pie. And since the pie is 10 years old, I have 10 raspberry pie projects that you can build. So put on your party hat and welcome to the workshop. Well, hello and welcome to the workshop and welcome to the party. Our favorite little microcomputer is now 10 years old. Now the Raspberry Pi is actually a leap year baby. The Raspberry Pi Model B was released on February the 29th, 2012. And yes, the Model B was released about a year before the Model A. Now the Raspberry Pi has gone on to become a favorite of makers and experimenters everywhere. And they've now sold more than 40 million of these incredible little devices. And there's a wide variety of Raspberry Pis to choose from now, including a microcontroller in the Raspberry Pi Pico. Now in order to celebrate this amazing occasion, I have not one but ten different projects that you can do with a Raspberry Pi. And these Pis range from things like the Raspberry Pi Zero all the way up to the Raspberry Pi 4. And I've also got three projects for the Raspberry Pi Pico. So there's something here for everyone. But before we get into our projects, I think it's only fair to pay tribute to our guest of honor by going through a little bit of the history of the Raspberry Pi. On February 29th, 2012, the world was introduced to the Raspberry Pi Model B, a single board computer that retailed for the unbelievable price of $35. The Raspberry Pi was the brainchild of Eben Upton, and it was built with a purpose. To understand that purpose, we need to go back all the way to 2006. In 2006, the world of technology was quite different from what it is today. Google was just getting popular, Facebook was only two years old, MySpace was the premium social network, and Twitter had just been born. Eben Upton was an engineer at Broadcom, and he had a project that he worked on during his evenings and weekends. Eben Upton had been inspired by the BBC Micro, a computer manufactured by Acorn Computers for use in schools in the UK. Eben had used one himself when he was in school. The BBC Micro was a great computer, but its 350 pound price tag kept it out of the reach of many schools. Eben was determined to create a single board educational computer that could be sold for a tenth of the price of the BBC Micro. This is one of his earlier prototypes. Eventually Eben had some success with his prototypes and he formed the Raspberry Pi Foundation in 2009. The Raspberry Pi Foundation was registered in the UK as an educational charity. Alpha embedded devices of the Raspberry Pi board were tested in 2011. In January of 2012, 10 of the original Raspberry Pi boards were sold on eBay. The first one sold for 3,500 pounds, 100 times more than what its intended retail price was. And at the end of the next month, on February 29, 2012, the Raspberry Pi Model B was released to the public. For $35 or £35, the Model B was quite a capable board. It had both composite and HDMI video, had connectors for an external display and for a camera, it had two USB 2 ports, an Ethernet port that could do 10 or 100 megabits per second, a stereo audio output, and was powered by a micro USB power supply. It used a micro SD card in lieu of a hard drive, and it was powered by a Broadcom BCM2835 CPU and GPU. The board had 512 megabytes of memory. Now you might be wondering about the name Raspberry Pi, but it was actually pretty common to name computer companies after fruits. The most well known, of course, is Apple computers. The Acorn Computer Company was the company that made the BBC Micro. And Apricot Computers had been around since 1965. Upton had once joked that he named it the Raspberry Pi because he was literally blowing a raspberry at all of the higher priced computer boards out there. Whether this is true or not is debatable. 
Now the obvious origin for the pi part of Raspberry Pi would be the numerical constant pi. However, most people say that the pi part of Raspberry Pi is for Python, the programming language that is used on the Raspberry Pi. Fast forward to today and the Raspberry Pi has a very extensive product line. The Raspberry Pi 4 Model B is the current flagship microcomputer and it's available with up to 8 gigabytes of RAM. On the other end of the spectrum, the Raspberry Pi Zero has three different models, including the new $15.02W. Raspberry Pi has also introduced their own microcontroller, the Raspberry Pi Pico that's powered by their own RP2040 chip and retails for a mere $4. The Raspberry Pi Compute Module allows you to take the power of the Raspberry Pi and use it in your own custom designs. And there's even an all-in-one computer, the Raspberry Pi Model 400, which gives you the power of a Raspberry Pi 4 along with a keyboard and everything you need. Just add a monitor and you're ready to go. So let's celebrate 10 years of the Raspberry Pi by building 10 Raspberry Pi projects. We'll begin by taking a look at a few Raspberry Pi boards. So here's a few Raspberry Pis. Uh, hopefully you have a Raspberry Pi already because they're a little bit difficult to get at the moment because of the global chip shortage and I hope that situation will change soon. Now I've got here the flagship of the whole line. It's the Raspberry Pi 4 Model B. This is a 4 gigabyte version. It comes in an 8 gigabyte version and a 2 gig as well. It used to come in a 1 gigabyte version but that one was discontinued. Below it we have a similar looking board and that's the Raspberry Pi model uh, 3B and the 3B is still available although it's not used that often but it is a powerful board and you can do a lot of the projects that we'll be doing today with the 3B. Now the uh, 4 has two HDMI outputs in uh, the form of two micro HDMI connectors. The 3 has one HDMI output and it's a full-size connector. They both have camera ports and they both have display ports. Uh, to power up the 4 you need need a USB-C connector and to power up the uh, 3 you'll use a micro SD power supply for it. Now over here we've got a Raspberry Pi Zero and this is how the Zero comes. It comes without anything soldered onto it so you don't get the GPIO connector like you do on these two Raspberry Pis. And I've got another one over here where I soldered up the GPIO. Uh, it also has uh, one connector over here for power and that's micro USB and another micro USB connector and it has a mini HDMI connector here for connecting the HDMI so you may need a cable or an adapter in order to use the video. Now you'll notice I've got a micro SD card plugged in over here on the uh, Raspberry Pi Zeros. They plug in on the top. On the 3 and the 4 the um, micro SD card goes in on the bottom over here here. And this is the Raspberry Pi Pico, the microcontroller made by Raspberry Pi. It's an incredible value at four bucks. It comes like this. It's got what's called castellated pins. So you can either solder on wires, you can solder on pins in order to use it on a circuit board or a breadboard, or you could actually surface mount it as well. And I've got one over here that I've soldered a number of pins on for use in a solder as a breadboard. So hopefully you'll be able to find some Raspberry Pis or you already have them and we can get going and build our 10 projects for the Raspberry Pi. Now many of the projects that we're working on today are going to require a micro SD card with the Raspberry Pi operating system installed on it. And the easiest way to install the Raspberry Pi operating system is with the imager software that Raspberry Pi provides. And you can get that off of their website. It's a very simple tool to use. You can download it for Linux, for Windows, or for Mac OS. And it works identically in all three operating systems. And it will allow you to install any version of the Raspberry Pi OS onto your micro SD card. Using the imager is very simple. Insert a micro SD card into your computer and launch the imager. By default you'll see the 32-bit version of the operating system but you can select a different one if you wish. In this case I'm going to be selecting the 64-bit version of the Raspberry Pi OS. 
You also need to choose your storage device, which would be the micro SD card you inserted in the computer. Then click the right button and confirm that you do indeed want to overwrite it. Now the process takes a little while, so I'm going to speed it up for you here. After writing, the imager will do a verify to make certain that everything has been written correctly. And after that, you're done. You can remove the micro SD card from your computer and insert it into your Raspberry Pi and boot up the Pi. The first time you boot up your Raspberry Pi, you're going to need to go through a configuration routine before you can use the operating system. The operating system will guide you through this. So on the window that appears, just go and click Next. You'll need to set up your location as well as your keyboard type and your language. These are all very important. You can change the default password if you wish. By default, the password is Raspberry. And you can also set up your screen. The next thing you can do is set up your Wi-Fi network. You'll have to provide your Wi-Fi password. After connecting to the Wi-Fi network, you should update the software. This will give you updates that have occurred since the software image was developed. And after that, your system is up to date and you are ready to use your brand new Raspberry Pi. Now here are the 10 projects that we're going to be doing to celebrate 10 years of the Raspberry Pi. If you've ever wanted to take an old sound system or some amplified speakers and connect to them via Bluetooth, AirPlay, or Spotify Connect, then Bolina Sound is the project for you. Virtual here allows you to run remote USB without any wires. If you want to put a webcam or a printer in another room and connect to it with your computer, this is a great project, and it works with Windows, Mac, and Linux. Do you remember the old Simon memory game? Well, we're going to build one with a Raspberry Pi Pico. We can already play music with Bolina Sound, but how about making our own music? Sonic Pi is an application that will allow us to make music by writing code. The Raspberry Pi is a great device for doing time-lapse photography. I'll show you how we can do this using LibCamera and FFmpeg. If you've ever wanted to run more than one operating system on your Raspberry Pi, then our dual boot project is just for you. I'll show you how you can run multiple operating systems on the same micro SD card or USB stick. We've got a really fun and interesting project here where we'll take a Raspberry Pi Pico and an Android phone or tablet and turn it into a rudimentary oscilloscope. If you're running a headless or remote Raspberry Pi, then you'll want to take a look at our standby switch project. It allows you to turn off and turn on your Pi with one push button. We've used NeoPixels with the Raspberry Pi Pico before, but we've never used the programmable input-output features. Today we're going to put all of that together. And finally, I'll show you a new feature that's in beta for the Raspberry Pi 4. It allows you to install your operating system onto a blank SD card or USB stick without the use of a separate computer. And so now let's go and take a look at our first project, Bolina Sound. Well, since we're having a party today, I thought we'd make our first project a music project, and that's why we're starting with Bolina Sound. Now, if the name Bolina sounds familiar to you, it's not that surprising, because for several years we've been using Bolina Etcher, which is an amazing free utility that allows you to burn SD and micro SD cards. And as a matter of fact, you're going to need to use Bolina Etcher or an equivalent utility to burn an image for the Raspberry Pi to complete this project. Now, now what Bolina Sound does is it allows you to take an older but perfectly functional stereo system or some amplified speaker systems and connect to them via Bluetooth, Spotify Connect, or Apple AirPlay. Not only that, you can use Bolina Sound to make a whole home audio system to spread music to up to 10 different sources around your home. So let's go and see what it takes to get Bolina Sound working with a Raspberry Pi. 
For this project, you'll require a Raspberry Pi 4 or a Raspberry Pi 3. You'll also need a micro SD card, and a 16 gigabyte card will be fine. An optional component would be a digital to analog converter or a DAC for improved sound quality. If you're using a DAC, you could also use a Raspberry Pi Zero, otherwise the Raspberry Pi Zero has no audio output capabilities. Now here's how Bellina sound works. A sound source, such as a tablet or a phone or a computer, connects to the Raspberry Pi which is running Bellina sound using Bluetooth. The audio output of that Raspberry Pi is fed into an audio system, which can be an amplified speaker system or a stereo system, and the sound is transmitted wirelessly. You can also add additional Raspberry Pis running Bellina Sound, which will connect wirelessly or through your local area network. This way you can make a whole house system, and you can have up to 10 of these on the free plan. Bellina Sound supports Bluetooth, Apple AirPlay, and Spotify Connect. It requires a free Bellina account to set up. With your free account, you're limited to a maximum of 10 devices. We don't need to install the Raspberry Pi OS on the micro SD card, as we'll be burning an image for Bellina Sound onto the card. You'll need some software to burn the micro SD card, and you can use Bellina Etcher or an equivalent. So now let's start working with Bellina Sound. Now in order to make use of Bellina Sound, you're going to need to make an account with Bellina because you need to use the Bellina dashboard to work with all of the Raspberry Pis that you create Bellina Sound devices out of. And you'll use the dashboard for everything, including rebooting the Raspberry Pis. Now the account is free to make, and as I said earlier, you get 10 free devices that you can use, which is pretty well enough for just about anybody's multi-room sound app application, so that's pretty good. You'll just need to provide some login credentials. You could use your email address. I used my GitHub account in order to log in, and that worked very well as well. Now, the first thing you need to do and what you'll be prompted when you get in is this screen here to create a fleet. A fleet is kind of like a fleet of ships or a fleet of vehicles. Uh, you have a fleet of devices that you are using with Bellina Sound, and this fleet will consist of a number of different Raspberry Pis. Now, you'll need to give a name to your fleet. I'm not going to do this because I already have one, but I just wanted to show you the screen. You'll need to choose the default device type, and they have a whole list of them, and if you scroll down, you'll eventually get to a number of Raspberry Pis. Now, this doesn't mean that all of the devices in the fleet have to be the same model of Raspberry Pi. It just means that if you choose one of these Raspberry Pi devices, it'll become the default device, and the other devices need to be similar, so any other Raspberry Pi will work as well in a fleet that you set up for, let's say, a Raspberry Pi 4. I used Raspberry Pi 4 as 64-bit operating system and the fleet type of starter is the one that they recommend and so you will go with that once you fill in that information you'll click the create new fleet button now as I said I've already got a fleet here and here is my first fleet my Bellina sound fleet which is what I called it and there's one device inside the fleet so if I click inside here we will see that I have this one device and it gave it a name of Ancient Hill. Now you can go and change your device names, but every device will get a unique name. And so if we go into Ancient Hill and take a look at it, we'll see that we get a number of different parameters over here and things we can do. I can reboot and restart all the services. It lists all the running services over here. I've got log files here. I can even go do a terminal and I can select a number of different terminals, the host OS, the Bluetooth, which can come in handy at one point. I couldn't connect the Bluetooth and I had to unpair a device and I used the terminal over there to do that. Uh, all sorts of information about 
about your device, the CPU, the temperature, the memory, everything you'd ever need to know. Um, we'll be looking at this a little bit later with device uh, configuration and variables. Uh, you can also go over here if you wish to and you can do things such as uh, shut down your device, you can purge the data, you can even delete the device if you want to remove it from your 10 different devices. Now, uh, if we go back into the fleets over here, or devices, excuse me, we can add another device. And this is what you need to do when you want to create your first Bolina sound device. You click on add device and you'll get to add a new device. And it's going to default to the type you set your fleet for. But again, you can go down and choose any device so you can use a different Raspberry Pi. The operating system you're going to keep is Bolina OS. You're going to select the latest version that's recommended. Now over here, it asks whether you want development or production. And for our type of use, we want development. So you're going to want to change that to development. That way you don't have to go through a build process. And for what we want to use Bolina Sound for, this is perfectly fine. You'll have to determine your network connection, whether it's going to use Ethernet or Wi-Fi and Ethernet. And your device always has to be connected to the internet because you need to maintain the device with, Bolina, with the Bolina Cloud, with the dashboard here. So it always has to have internet connectivity. Now, once you've selected all of this, go down here to the flash button and go to the side to the arrow and do download configuration, uh, sorry, download Bolina OS. And this will download a zip file. And the zip file, in turn, you'll need to burn onto a micro SD card. And you can use something like Bolina Etcher, which is obviously what they'd recommend, or any other micro SD burner to make the CD, that, sorry, the, uh, the micro SD the image that you're going to be using in your Raspberry Pi. And once you burn that image, you're going to insert it into your Raspberry Pi, boot it up. Uh, if you have a screen on it, it isn't going to show you much. It'll show you just uh, a number of text messages as it's booting up. And then it'll just end up on a Bolina symbol that just stays on the screen. So you don't really need to have a screen on the Raspberry Pi. And once you have it booted up again, you can go into here and you can manipulate the Pi or restart it if you have. But as long as everything is running that you need, Bluetooth, AirPlay, etc., then you should be good to go. You'll just need to plug in some speakers and some amplified speakers, that is, and uh, get a Bluetooth device such as a phone or a tablet and connect to it and see if you can play some music. So let's go and do exactly that. Okay, so I've got a Raspberry Pi connected to a couple of amplified speakers over here. I'm just connected through the audio output jack of the Pi. And I've got my phone over here, and right now I've got some music all queued up to go, but it's currently playing on the phone speaker. And so what I'll do is I'll swipe down at the top and hit this here. And not sure if you can see it, but I've got a Bolina OS as a Bluetooth device. And I'll hit that and say done. Go back to my music player. And there we go. And so this seems to work pretty well just with the Raspberry Pi audio output. The sound quality isn't really that bad and I have full remote speakers for my music player on my telephone thanks to Bolina Sound. Now it may not have appeared so in the little demo that it just gave you because of the angle of the microphones and the fact the acoustics in the workshop aren't particularly great, but the sound quality was actually fairly good when I just had the speakers plugged into the audio output jack on the Raspberry Pi. But you can improve the sound quality if you have a high quality audio system or speakers by adding an additional DAC or digital to analog converter to your Raspberry Pi. Pi. And 
The Bolina Sound supports a number of different DACs, and they have a page, which I've linked to in the article accompanying this project, where they show you the supporting DACs. And the one I'm going to use is right over here, the Pimeroni Fat DAC. And they have a configuration you're going to need to add in order to do that. And the configuration has uh, two values, the parameter, which is going to be this, Bolina Host Config DT Overlay, and then the value, which in this case is high five berry uh, dash DAC and so you'll need to add that in by going down to device configuration and scrolling down and then add a custom configuration and you'll add the variable and I've conveniently put these onto a text file over here so that I can remember them and get them spelt correctly because of course they are case sensitive so I'm going to put the variable name in here and go back into my file and it's hi-fi berry DAC that I'm going to use as a value. And I'll paste that in and I'll add that. And what I'm going to do is you need to recycle by rebooting your device, but actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to shut my device down because I need to actually install the DAC onto the GPIO of the Raspberry Pi. So I'm just going to go over here and do a shutdown. And when you do this, it tells you the action can't be reversed. They tell you the number of devices to confirm, and I'm only shutting down one device, so I'm going to shut down one device and it's going to shut down my device called Ancient Hill and once it shuts down I'll install the DAC onto it and boot it up plug the audio into that and see if we can get some even better quality sound out of my Bolina sound device and so I've added my Pi Moroni fat DAC onto the top of my Raspberry Pi. It just plugs into the GPIO. And I've plugged the cable to the speakers into the DAC instead of onto the jack that's on the Raspberry Pi. And so now that I've done my configuration, I'm just all set to try this out. So let's give it a whirl. And it does seem to work pretty well. The sound quality is a bit better. Even I can tell that over here. You might not be able to hear that because of my microphone arrangement. But this is a good method of driving a high quality sound system. Or if you're using a Raspberry Pi Zero, this is pretty well the only method that you can use because the Raspberry Pi Zero doesn't have an audio output jack. So as you can see, Bolina Sound is a great way to add remote sound devices throughout your home using a Raspberry Pi. Now when you connect the USB device such as a printer or a webcam up to your computer, you normally just use a USB cable. But what do you do when that device is located a long distance away from your computer? Well there are a couple of options here. You can buy USB extender devices but they require a long piece of wire or an ethernet cable in order to function and sometimes that's not very practical, especially if your device is in another room. Well if you've got that problem then I have the solution and it's called virtual here virtual here allows you to take a raspberry pi and connect the usb device to it and then use it with any other computer that shares the same network as the raspberry pi best of all that computer will see the device just as if it's a standard usb device and all you need to do on that computer is run a virtual here client and there are clients available for windows for mac os and for linux so let's go and see how we can set up virtual here on a Raspberry Pi. You can run virtual here on a Raspberry Pi 4, a Raspberry Pi 3, or a Raspberry Pi 0. You'll also need a micro SD card, and a 16 gigabyte card will work fine. With Virtual Here, you connect your USB devices to the USB ports on the Raspberry Pi running Virtual Here. You then use your local area network or Wi-Fi connection to connect to the target computer. The target computer will see the USB devices as if they were directly connected to its USB ports. Virtual Here will work with Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. The workstation will require a Virtual Here client. 
There's also an addition to Virtual here called EasyFind that will allow you to access your USB devices over the internet from anywhere in the world. Before we start working with Virtual here, you'll need to install the latest version of the Raspberry Pi OS on the micro SD card. So now let's set up Virtual here. Now in order to use Virtual here with our Raspberry Pi, we're going to need to install the Virtual here server software onto the Pi. So we'll go to their website and at the top of the page you'll see they have a link for USB servers. And there are all different sorts of operating systems here. There's Windows and OS X, which is actually now called Mac OS. But it, we want a Linux one because we're using a Raspberry Pi. So let's go into Linux. And here we have a number of different choices for ways to do it. There's a script that you can run, etc. But the easiest way that I've found is just to go down here where you'll see a selection under generic virtual here USB server builds. And there's one specifically for the Raspberry Pi. So you want to download that file. Now that we've done that, we can go into our terminal in order to run everything. Now, first of all, we want to change to our downloads directory because that's where it would have gone to. And we'll take a look in the directory, and there's our file VHUSBDARM. Now we need to make this into an executable file, and so we'll do a sudo, the chmod, and we'll give it a executable with a plus x, and then VH, and we can hit the tab key, it'll finish it for us. And we've done that, and now all we need to do is actually run this. We run this with sudo again. And the virtual here USB server is running. And uh, that's pretty simple. There's really not too much to that. And it'll keep running until you hit a control C. We can hit control C to stop that. And our server has stopped. Now, one thing that you might want to do is you might want to make this run every time that you boot up the Pi. And there is actually a way to do that. I've got that in my command sequence. Let me just go back to it. And there we go, sudo nano uh, etc.rc local. We're going to edit that file, which I've actually already done, in order to make this work every time we boot up the Pi. And so you'll open this file, and if you go down right at the very bottom, before the exit, you can add this line here, slash home, slash pi, downloads, slash vhusb, darm, and then the... Dash B at the end of that will make it run in the background so you can do other things on your Raspberry Pi. And once you've done that, you'll do a Control X to exit it. And if there's something to save, it'll ask you if you want to write out, you'll have to say yes. And you can do that. And so that's really all there is to setting up the virtual here server. It's quite simple. Now let's hook up uh, something to the USB port and give it a test. So now that I have Virtual here running on my Raspberry Pi, the next step is to install a client device on the client that I want to use. Now I'm on Microsoft Windows now, so I've gone to the Virtual here homepage and I went to client and I downloaded the client for Windows 64-bit and they've got clients for all sorts of things, 32-bit window clients, Mac OS clients and uh, Linux clients. So you've got clients for pretty well every type of machine out there. Now the client is this an exe uh, file you don't need to install anything you just need to run the exe so i'm already doing that and i've got my virtual here client going and it already sees my raspberry hub now i didn't have to configure anything on the wi-fi of this computer it's just picking it up via wi-fi and uh, it shows that there are three de three device ports on that raspberry hub one of which is currently occupied, and it's this one over here. So I'm going to right click and say use this device. And so I'm going to use this device. Now what this device is, is a webcam, which I thought would be a pretty good test for something like this, because of course it needs a bit of bandwidth, etc. And so I've got a webcam, and it's just in my office right now. It's pointing at the side of my desk at a couple of my computers, so it's not really that throwing a scene. But I'm going to run the camera application here. And there it is. And there's the side of my office. And uh, you can see a couple of my computers there. Again, not really too thrilling a view. But this is in the other room. And there are no wires connected between the, the Windows computer I'm using in the workshop 
and between the camera and the office this is just going over virtual here so this works really really well and if you wanted to do something like extend the webcam like i'm doing or extend the printer virtual here is a great way to do it now there are some restrictions using the trial version and the website isn't particularly clear as to what those restrictions are from what i understand i can continue to use this one device as long as i want to and if that's all you need to do that's fine if you want to use multiple devices, and I believe you can use up to 127, there's a one-time license fee, and it's around $50, which is a bit steep, but then again, if it's only a one-shot and you have a number of things to run, it might indeed be worth it. So this is a way you can use a Raspberry Pi to extend your USB using Virtual Here. In 1978, Milton Bradley released a game called Simon, and it's been around ever since. Now, Milton Bradley has now changed name to Hasbro, but the game has stayed the same. It has four colored areas on a circle, and the colored areas light up in sequence, and then you have to repeat the sequence. If you get it correct, it lights up more areas and becomes more challenging. If you get it incorrect, it makes a nasty sound, and you start all over from scratch. Well, we're going to build a Simon game today, and we're going to do it with a Raspberry Pi Pico. It's a lot of fun, and it's a great way to also learn about how to use the Raspberry Pi Pico with the Arduino IDE. So let's go and see what it takes to make a Simon game. For our Simon game, we'll be using a Raspberry Pi Pico microcontroller. We'll also need four colored LEDs. Now, if you want to emulate the original Simon, you'll need a green, red, yellow, and blue LED. We'll need four momentary contact push button switches. Now, you can use any push buttons that you like, but if you can get colored ones, get ones that match the colors of your LEDs. We'll require some dropping resistors for the LEDs. Any value between 100 and 220 ohms will work. I used 120 ohm resistors for this. And we'll require a piezoelectric buzzer in order to make some sound. Once you've gathered together all of your components, here's how we'll wire it up. We'll connect the green LED's anode through its dropping resistor to the Pico Pin GP13. The red LED's anode goes through its dropping resistor to Pico Pin GP12. The yellow LED's anode connects through its dropping resistor to Pico's pin GP11. And the blue LED anode goes through its dropping resistor to Pico pin GP10. We'll tie all of the LED cathodes to one of the Pico's grounds. There are several ground terminals on the Pico. You'll notice them by the square connections, and you can use any one you wish. Now let's move on to our push buttons. We'll tie one side of the green push button switch to Pico pin GP18. One side of the red push button will be connected to Pico pin GP19, the yellow push button to Pico pin GP20, and one side of the blue push button to Pico pin GP21. We'll connect the other side of all of the push buttons to one of the Pico's ground pins. Finally, we'll connect the positive side of the piezoelectric buzzer to Pico pin GP3. The negative side of the buzzer will be connected to a ground. And this completes our wiring. Now let's go set up our Arduino IDE for the Raspberry Pi Pico, and then we'll run a sketch in order to make our Simon game. Now in a previous video I showed you how you could use the Raspberry Pi Pico with the Arduino IDE 2.0 and you could certainly use the IDE 2.0 with this project. However, I haven't shown you how you use it with the older IDE version 1.8 and so I'm going to do that right now. Now we need to install a boards manager for it so we're going to go into our board section and go to boards manager and in the filter we'll just type in Pico. And over here we'll see the Arduino Embed OS RP2040 boards, and the boards included in this package are the Raspberry Pi Pico. Now I've already installed mine, but if you haven't done that, you're going to get an install button over here, and you can click on it to install the Raspberry Pi Pico. Now if you go down again into your boards manager and go to board, you will see 
the RP2040 boards and here's the Raspberry Pi Pico. So we'll select that. And we'll see down here that we've got a Raspberry Pi Pico on one of my ports. Now, if you don't see that initially, what you're going to need to do is hold down the boot cell key on the Pico before you plug it in, hold the key down, plug in the USB cable, and then release it. And then you should be able to see it. There's also a quirk in which sometimes if you go under tools and go under port, you won't see the Pico, even though it is listed down over here, and that's fine once you load your first sketch up to it it'll appear up in that ports menu and that just appears to be a quirk of the Arduino IDE 1.8. So now that we've got the IDE set up for the Raspberry Pi Pico let's take a look at the sketch we'll be using to make our Simon game. Now here's the code that we're going to be using for our Pico Simon game, and it's a fairly long bit of code, but if you break it down, it's pretty easy to understand. Now we'll start off by defining a number of constants and variables for our game. And the first thing we define is the maximum level, and I've got it set to 100. And the way that the Simon game works is the first time you play it, you're playing at level one, and only one LED is going to flash, and you have to remember which one flashed. And assuming you got that successfully you'll go to level two where it flashes two LEDs in sequence and you'll have to remember that sequence. After that you'll go to level three where there are three LEDs etc. So with a maximum level of 100 we would have 100 different flashes to remember and that's pretty high. I don't think anyone's going to get that high but if you do find that you actually can get that high you could always increase that number. Then we're going to set up three different arrays and we're going to set them to the same size is that maximum level. And the first array is the sequence, and this is the sequence of LED flashes and tones that we're going to give for our Simon game, the ones that we present to the user. The sound is the different tones that go along with those sequence, and so it has to be set to the same thing. And the player sequence array is the stuff that you enter in, so the buttons that you press, and also you need to have that array the same size as the other two arrays. We're going to start off with a level and our level is going to start at one and note just uh, indicates what note we are going to play on the piezo speaker and we're going to go at zero hertz because note is always a value of a frequency and then the velocity and velocity is how quickly they go by and this is a delay so the shorter this number is it starts off as a second so there's a second delay between the different flashes it'll decrease as the difficulty goes higher and higher now we just define a few constants for our sounds and these are the frequencies of the sounds and you can change them if you wish but if you look on a chart of musical notes you'll see this is actually do, re, mi, fa and then the buzzer sound which is the bad sound over here and then the LED definitions the pins we have our LEDs on and the push button definitions the pins for our push button and the piezo button buzzer excuse me on pin number three GPIO3. Then we go in the setup which is pretty simple the LEDs are all outputs the push buttons are inputs and we're going to use the internal pull-up resistors in the Pico so that we don't have to provide our own pull-up resistors and the buzzer of course is an output now we'll go into the loop and the loop calls a number of functions which are the key of understanding the game so we start off at level one so if the level is one we generate the sequence so let's go down and see what generate sequence is. here's the generate sequence function and this is where we populate our arrays both our sound arrays and our sequence arrays with the different patterns that we're going to have to do now we want a random pattern so we're going to seed our random number and we're going to seed it with millis which is the number of milliseconds since the processor has started so we're going to get a truly different number every time that we play this and that'll create a truly different seed for our random and then we're going to go and step through all the way up to our maximum level minus one because remember arrays always start at zero so we're going to start from zero to the maximum level which we've defined as a hundred an increment and in each one of these increments we're going to take a random number and the random is interesting because I've used blue LED and then the green LED plus one now that might seem odd but remember these are integers so blue LED is actually equal to 10 and green LED is equal to 13 so we're going from 10 to 
14, and that's the nature of the random function. The random function, the higher number, is never achieved. So we're going to get numbers of 10, 11, 12, or 13, which are the pinouts for our LEDs. And so we do a case and we see which ones we're getting. If it's the case of the blue LED, in other words, if it's a 10, we're going to play the blue sound. We're going to define note as being the frequency of the blue sound. Yellow is the yellow sound, etc., etc. And at the end of this, the sound array is going to be populated with that note. So with this, we're populating both the sound array and the sequence array. The sequence array is going to have the pins of the LEDs we want to flash, and the sound array is going to have the different notes. So let's go back up into the loop and see what happens next. So remember, we've started off at level one. Our game is just starting. And we're going to flash the LEDs in sequence. And this basically just creates a chaser effect over here. And it will go on and on and on until something happens. Now, if something happens, such as you press the green button, which is how you start the game, the push button assigned to green also starts the game, then we do something different. So we look to see if either that button's been pressed or, and this is an or symbol here, the level is greater than 1. And if either case is true, then we want to proceed with the game. So we're going to delay a second, and we're going to do two functions here. Show the sequence, which is what shows the different LEDs and sounds, and get the sequence, which is what gets the player input. So let's take a look at those functions. So we'll go down to show sequence. Show sequence starts by turning off all the LEDs, and then we step through from 0 to whatever the level happens to be. And again, remember, array start at zero. So we're going to step through the number of times we have in the array. And we're going to read our our sequence uh, array and do a digital write to that pin because remember this is going to be 10, 11, 12, or 13. We're going to write it high. We're going to turn the LED on. Then we're going to do a tone and we're going to going to send a tone to the piezo and we're going to do the sound in that array. So we'll get a tone and an LED. We're going to delay by the period of the velocity and then we're going to turn off our LED and turn off the tone and delay a little bit. So this is going to show us our entire sequence. Now get sequence is where we get the user's entry. So we start off with a flag, which is zero uh, until the user has pressed the button. And then we're going to again step through from zero to the level that we're at. <clears throat> we're going to reset the flag to zero at the beginning of this. And then we do a while. And as long as the flag is equal to zero, we're looking to see if a button has been pressed. Now we have a check green, check red, uh, check yellow, and check blue. They're all the same except, of course, for the LEDs and the buttons that they deal with. So if uh, we look at check green, for example, if the button is low, that means we've pressed it because remember they're pulled up high. We're going to write to the green LED and send it high. We're going to play the green sound and then we're going to delay by the period specified by velocity and then we'll turn off the sound and uh, then we'll go to the player sequence which um, is the sequence that we're entering. We're going to enter the value of our green LED. We're going to set our flag to 1 and we're going to delay by a small amount. Then we have to see if our selection was actually correct. So if it was wrong, this is going to be true. The sequence here, the player sequence, is not going to be equal to sequence. So we go to another function called wrong sequence, and we return and get out of here. At any rate, we also turn our LED off. We go through all of these, and if we make it to the bottom over here, then we've actually done it correct. So we go to another function called the right sequence. So now we have to see what the right and the wrong sequence sequence functions do. The right sequence says our sequence is correct. So what we're going to do is we're going to flash all the LEDs. We're going to turn them off. We're going to delay. We're going to turn them on, delay, and turn them off again to indicate that, yay, you've done it correctly. Now we're going to move to the next level. So as long as we haven't hit maximum level, we're going to increase the level, and we're also going to reduce that velocity by a tiny amount, and that'll reduce the time delay between when the sequences are displayed, so it makes it a little bit harder. Now, if it was wrong, though, and we went to this wrong sequence function, we're going to go turn on 
all the LEDs and turn them off. And we do this in a loop over here. So we do this three times. We flash all of our LEDs. And during that, we also play the bad sound over here, the buzzer to indicate that no, you've got it wrong. Then we reset our difficulty back to one and reset our velocity to a thousand. And so it's a long sketch, but if you take it piece by piece, it's actually quite understandable. So let's load it up to our Pico and play our Simon game. And here we have our Simon game on a Sautilus breadboard. You can see, of course, my Pico and my buzzer is over here. Uh, you can certainly see the four lights as they're chasing right now. And I've got my four push button switches. And so to begin the Simon game, I'm going to press the green button. And green is my first color. So I'll press it and I get a flash. I got that correct. Wow. So now it's green, blue. And I get another flash. I'm on a roll. I'm doing great. Now let's do it incorrectly. And you see, I get the flashing and it goes back to level one. And I can start the game again with the green button. And we can basically play this all day. But uh, it does a very good emulation of the original Simon game. And of course, if you had the skills to use something like a 3D printer or you could find a round case, you could even build it into the same type of a case as Simon. And so we can make a great game using a Raspberry Pi Pico and a couple of extra components. Now I've got another music project for you, but this time instead of sending pre-recorded music around our home, we are going to make music and we're going to do it with a product called Sonic Pi. Now, unlike other music creation software like GarageBand or Logic Pro, Sonic Pi is a program that lets you make music by writing code. And if you think you can't make decent music by writing code, there are some great examples up on YouTube of some very impressive compositions that were made using Sonic Pi. So let's go and see what it takes to make our Raspberry Pi into a musical instrument using Sonic Pi. In order to run Sonic Pi, you'll need a Raspberry Pi 4. Now, Sonic Pi will run on a lesser Raspberry Pi. However, this product does benefit from RAM memory, and a 2 gigabyte or even better 4 gigabyte Pi 4 is ideal. You don't need to, however, go all the way to an 8 gigabyte Pi 4. You'll also need a micro SD card, and a 16 gigabyte card will be perfectly fine. Sonic Pi is a code-based music creation and performance tool. It uses a language that's based upon Ruby in order to make music. It also supports external MIDI devices for additional control. Now you'll need to install the 32-bit Raspberry Pi OS on the micro SD card. As of the time of this filming, Sonic Pi will not work on the 64-bit version. So get your Raspberry Pi set up and we'll install and use Sonic Pi. All right, I'm on my 32-bit version of the Raspberry Pi operating system, and I've opened up the Chromium web browser, and I've gone to sonic-pi.net, so I'm on the Sonic Pi homepage, and I'm about to install the program. Now, as I said earlier, you're going to need to do this under a 32-bit version of the Raspberry Pi operating system. I tried it under the 64-bit version, and it did not work. However, there is a method you can install it on the 64 4-bit version, or for that matter here on the 32-bit version, and it will work, but you will get an earlier version of the program, but I did want to show that to you. Uh, if you go over here and if you go over to Preferences and to Recommended Software, and if you go down to Programming, because interestingly enough, this is actually considered to be a program, and you scroll down, it's alphabetical, 
you'll find Sonic Pi, and you can install it from here. But as I said, you're going to get an earlier version. At the moment, it's version 3.2.2. And if we go down over here in the Sonic Pi webpage and hit the Raspberry Pi button, you can see that you're going to get version 3.3.1. So it's a much later version of Sonic Pi. And so we're going to download that right now. And it says it can harm your computer because it's a deb file, but we want to keep it. We're going to trust this. And it's there. So let's go and show it in the folder. And there it is in my downloads directory. And we can simply double click on that to install it. Yes, I want to install the file. You need to authenticate, and if you haven't changed the password on your Raspberry Pi, then the default password is Raspberry. And it looks like our installation is complete. So let's close this window and also close the Chromium window. And if we go up into our menu, now remember this is a programming, so it doesn't appear under sound and video as you might expect it would. And there it is, Sonic Pi, and we can launch it from here. And we get the splash screen, and it seems that you have to actually click on the splash screen in order to proceed further. And as you can see, we've got version 3.3.1, so it's the latest version. And here we go, and we've got our welcome screens, and we're in Sonic Pi. Now, Sonic Pi is a pretty extensive program, and obviously I can't teach you how to use it today, but we can do a couple of examples. I'll just close this window here. If you go down here and go to the live coding, you'll get a complete lesson over here on how to use Sonic Pi, and it's quite extensive. And I'm sorry I haven't found any method of making the text larger, so I know this is probably just about impossible to see on your screen, but they give you some simple examples. So let's take the first one over here here and we'll copy it into the editor over here and this is the editor area here so we'll paste that over here and then we'll hit the run key and if you can hear that we've got some beats going right now and we can stop that we'll go down a little bit and they have a slight modification to it over here so we'll copy that one Paste that in, it's added one more line of code. And we can stop that as well. And as we continue down, they've got a more extensive example over here. Let me just see, oops, if I can copy that correctly. There, I think I got that correctly. Let's try it. And we get a guitar sound in there as well. <laughs> and so as you could see, you could do a lot of things with code in Sonic Pi to make your own music. Now I'm sure you've seen time-lapse photography before. It's a photographic technique that's been around for generations. And it involves taking a series of still pictures over a period of time and then stitching them together to make a movie. And you can make some great movies. You can watch clouds move across the sky. You can watch a snowstorm develop if you live in an area that has snowstorms. Or you could cut an apple in half and watch it turn brown. There's a lot of possibilities here. And you can use a Raspberry Pi to do time-lapse photography. Now you may have seen some instructions for doing this before, but chances are those instructions were for older versions of the Raspberry Pi operating system and are no longer applicable to the new version of the Raspberry Pi OS. But I'm going to show you how you can use both LibCamera and a utility called FFmpeg to take some pictures and then stitch them together to make an MP4 movie. So let's go and see how we can use our Raspberry Pi to do time-lapse photography. For the time-lapse camera project, you can use just about any Raspberry Pi microcomputer. You could use a Pi 4, a Pi 3, or a Pi 0. You'll also need a micro SD card, and I'd recommend at least a 16 gigabyte card. If you want to make some very long time-lapse sequences, you might want to use a bigger card. 
Naturally, you'll need a camera for your Raspberry Pi, and there are a wide variety to choose from, both from Raspberry Pi and from other manufacturers. You'll also need a cable to connect your camera to the Raspberry Pi CSI port. And if you're using a Raspberry Pi Zero, you need to remember that it requires a special cable as it has a smaller CSI connector. You'll need to format that microSD card with the Raspberry Pi OS. You'll need the bullseye version or later in order to run the code that I'm going to be presenting. So now let's build our time-lapse camera. Now I've got my Raspberry Pi high quality camera connected up to the Raspberry Pi 4 that I'm using and the reason I used the HQ camera was because it has a tripod mount so it's very easy to make use of. So I've got it sitting here on the workbench. We're just going to be taking some fascinating pictures of my fingers. Now I'm going to go into the terminal now and we're going to be making use of Lib Camera. Lib Camera is the new camera stack that comes with the Raspberry Pi operating system and I recently did a video about Lib camera. So if you'd like to learn more about it, please check out that video. And we're going to be using an app called Lib Camera Still. So let's type in that. And Lib Camera Still pops up a preview image which should stay on the screen for about five seconds. And it hasn't recorded anything. It's just basically put an image up on my screen. So now we can expand upon that. If we want that to stay up a bit longer, we give it a dash T parameter, which is time. And I'm going to give it a value of 10,000. And this is in milliseconds, so this should stay up for about 10 seconds now. And so once again, we can watch the fascinating image of my fingers. And this time, we can enjoy it for about 10 seconds. And there we go. Now I'm going to add some other parameters in, and I will then explain what the parameters mean. I'm going to change the 10,000 to 60,000, which of course means one minute. And I'm going to give it a time-lapse parameter and give that a value of 5,000. And I'm going to give it a frame start, whoops, just two dashes, frame start perimeter, and give that a value of one. And then a dash O, which is my output file, I'm going to call it test. And I'm going to put a percentage, a 0, 4, and a D, and then dot JPG. And I will explain that to you. But first of all, let's just hit enter and watch it run. I've got the image of my fingers, which I'll keep moving over here for some variety. And it took a picture, as you can see. That's why it froze there. And we'll go on, and it took another picture. Now let's take a look at that command further. Now the dash T, of course, is the total period in milliseconds. So with a value of 60,000, we're going to go for a minute. Time lapse, the period after that is also in milliseconds. And that's how often I'm taking a picture. So I gave it 5,000. So every five seconds, I'll be taking a picture here. Frame start tells me which frame I want to save first. And I want to save the first one. So I gave it a parameter of one. O tells me the output file name, and you'll notice at the end of the output file name, I put percent %04D. And what that will do is it'll append the file name I gave it, which was test percent %04D, with a number. So it'll be test 0001, test 0002, etc., etc., and it'll keep going up. The 4 in there tells me I wanted to use 4 digits. If I used a 3D, it would be a 3-digit number. So now I'm finished taking my pictures. Let's take, take a look in my directory and here they are. I've got 11 different files after that and I could have gone up to 9999 but 11 files is correct if you think about it because you might think there would be uh, 12 of them in a 60 second period at five seconds each but remember it has to wait for the first five seconds to elapse and it doesn't do the last one and so if we take a look at these pictures no doubt we'll see some wonderful pictures of my fingers and we can see them moving around. And so it's an excellent time lapse, but of course we'd really like to put that into a video. So let me show you how we do that. So now let's take a look at a command that we can use in order to turn our still pictures into a video file. And we're going to be making use of the FFmpeg utility. Now we can use FFmpeg not only with the images we took with our Raspberry Pi camera, we could also import some images from another camera if we wanted to and make a time-lapse video out of them. Now this is a pretty long command, so let's go and take a look at the syntax of it before I run it.
Now, the first uh, parameter on here is the frame rate, and that's the number of images per second. Now, 30 is the value that you would normally use for a smooth flowing video, although you could also use 24. Those are two very common frame rates. However, in this particular case, I'm going to be using 10, and that's just because I only have 11 images. So if I were to use a value like 30, I would make a video that's one third of a second long, and it wouldn't even be uh, long enough to play. So I'm using a value of 10 because I've taken all of 11 images. Now the pattern type is set to glob and glob basically means global. It means use all of the different files. What FFmpeg will do is if it sees two consecutive files that are very very similar it'll try to skip them if you don't give it a parameter like that. Now the dash i is the input file and I just did a star.jpg which means it'll take every file with the extension jpg that I happen to have. Now if you have another pattern you could put it inside there as well. And then SV is the aspect ratio of the video, the horizontal and vertical size of the video. CV is the output video codec, and the one that we were using, LibX264, is a common codec that you would likely want to use. CRF is the compression factor, and the compression factor indicates how much we compress the video to. Uh, you can play with different numbers, but 17 is a very common value to use. And PixFMT has always been set to YUV420P, and that'll allow it to be used by just about every video player. Otherwise, certain video players, such as the one on Microsoft Windows, will refuse to play the file. And then after that, we give it the file name, which in my case is going to be test.mp4. So it's going to create an mp4 file out of our video. So let's go back up onto the terminal here and enter that and watch FFmpeg in action. And it's going to process the video right now. And it's processing it at 10 frames per second. There only are 11 pictures. And so now we're going to go into the Pi directory. And here we have test.mp4, a very small video that should run for approximately one second because it's 10 frames per second and we had 11 images here. So let's open it up. And there it is very quickly. We've run a video. And of course, if this had a lot more pictures, we could have made a much longer video. And we could have also made it at 30 frames per second, which would be a little less choppy. And I'm going to go off now and record a longer video. And then we can take a look at a longer time lapse video using the exact same technique. So I put together my own little time-lapse video in order to demonstrate for you, and here's the command that I used with LibCamera still. And so as you can see, I'm going for half an hour right now and doing a picture every 10 seconds. And what I'm taking a picture of is a plate with some ice cubes on it, and I'm letting the ice cubes melt. And so I'm taking a picture of my ice cubes every 10 seconds, and after I get all my pictures, here's the FFmpeg command that I'm going to do in order to create a video called icemelt.mp4 and that should be a time delay video of my ice cubes melting and so I have all of that over here and as you can see I've got all of these JPEGs and it goes all the way down there's 179 of them which if you work it out every 10 seconds starting 10 seconds after the beginning is perfectly correct for a half hour and then it creates the ice melt video so let me give you the world premiere of my amazing ice melt video it's probably not going to win any Academy Awards but I still think it's pretty cool and there go my cubes That's fascinating. So that's a half hour uh, taking a place within a couple of seconds using the time-lapse technique on the Raspberry Pi.
Now, dual boot or multi boot functionality is a common feature on desktop computers, especially for Linux computers. Many Linux computers can also be booted up with different versions of Linux or with something like Microsoft Windows. And you do that by booting the computer where you get a menu and you choose the operating system you want to use. Well, you may not realize it, but you can also have this capability with a Raspberry Pi. And you can use it with either a micro SD card or a USB stick or even with both. So let me show you how you can add multi-boot capability to a Raspberry Pi. Pi. You can use dual boot on any Raspberry Pi microcomputer. You could use a Raspberry Pi 4, a Pi 3, or a Pi 0. You'll also need a micro SD card, and I would recommend a 32 gigabyte or greater card because you're going to be installing multiple operating systems. You can actually install two or more operating systems onto your card. When booting up your Pi, you'll get a menu to select the operating system. Now one requirement is that you need to format your micro SD card with FAT32, and you may find this difficult to do if the card is over 32 gigabytes. However, I've found the free utility from Verbatim that allows you to format any size micro SD card to FAT32. Let me show you how it works. The Verbatim Smart Disk Utility only runs under Microsoft Windows, and you'll need to have the micro SD card inserted in the computer first before you launch it. After you launch it, just click the Format Drive button. Say yes to the fact that you're going to overwrite the card, and the card will be formatted in FAT32, and this will work with any size of micro SD card. Once you're done, the card is ready for our dual boot procedure. Now, setting up a multi-boot Raspberry Pi has been made easy thanks to a website from New Zealand called the PIN System Resize. And when we go to that website, the first thing we need to do is select our media, and we have three choices. We can just put everything onto a micro SD card, and that's what I'm going to be doing today. But you could also put everything onto a USB drive and boot off of that. You have a third choice, which is to use both, and that's to put the boot utility onto a micro SD SD card and put the operating systems onto a USB drive. But as I said, I'm going to be using just the SD card. So once I've selected SD card, I need to tell it what size my card is. And I'm going to be using a 64 gigabyte card. Now, if you're using another card, you can make a different selection or you can even type it into that box. Now, the next thing we need to do, and this is very important, is to select the board we're going to be using. And I'm using a Raspberry Pi 4 Model B. And as you can see, they've got pretty well every Raspberry Pi over here. So I'll select that. And we go to the page where we can actually select our systems. And there are quite a few to choose from. Now, these are minimal versions of the operating system. So if you want to put one of the light versions on, you can do that. They have games over here you can use. They have utilities that you can put put in over here. Uh, these ones are just for testing. General is where I'm going to be going. And in general, you've got a number of different operating systems, and I'm going to put two onto mine. I'm going to put a 64-bit Raspberry Pi OS, and that's the full one. And I'm also going to go and put an Ubuntu system on as well. And you can choose more than two. You can choose as many as you want, but just remember that these are going to all take up some space on your micro SD card. So you need to have space for all these operating systems. Once you've done that, you go back to the top and click Next. And this is where you get to do the partitioning. Now, it's suggesting making an equal size partition for both. And I'm going to do that, but you could use this slider over here to change the size of the partitions in case you wanted to give more of a partition to one operating system and less to another one. I'm going to reset that so that they're equal, and I'll do next. And then we're basically done. We have two files we need to download. We're going to download the pinlight.zip file and a recovery file. So let's download this file, and this will send us off to SourceForge. And from SourceForge, we can download the file. So I'm going to save that file. And you also need to download this file as well, the recovery.cmd line file. And so I'm going to also download that file.
And so now that my files have been downloaded, <clears throat> you can see them over here. What I'm going to do first of all is I'm going to create a new directory. And here's create new folder. I'm going to call it pin. I'm going to open this with the archive manager. I'm going to do an extract. I'm going to extract it into here, into the pin directory I've just created. I can close that. As you see now, it's got a directory here. What I want to do is take this recovery.cmd line and copy it into that directory. So I'm going to copy that and I'm going to paste it into this folder. It's going to give me a message that there's a file in there that I'm overwriting and I want to do that. So I'm going to replace the file. And if we go into this directory, now we'll see there's a number of different files here. We need to copy this into our formatted micro SD card. So we need to copy the entire contents of this directory onto the micro SD. And then we can use that to boot up our Raspberry Pi. After inserting the micro SD card into the Raspberry Pi and booting it up, you'll see it copy a few files and then you'll arrive at a menu. At the bottom of the screen, you can set the type of keyboard and the language you want to use. So I'm changing it from the UK to the US. At the top of the screen, there are a few items you can configure. For example, you can set up a Wi-Fi network, although you're much better off using an Ethernet because you're going to be copying a lot of files right now. Now just make certain there's a check mark beside both the operating systems you want to use and click the install button. Say yes, and the procedure of installing both of the operating system onto the micro SD card will begin. Now I'm going to speed this up because it does take a little while, but you'll notice that it actually installs both of the operating systems simultaneously. So you'll get screens that show me both the Raspberry Pi operating system and the Ubuntu operating system that I'm installing on my micro SD card. Once the procedure is done, you can click OK. And you'll come back to the menu that you're now going to see every time you boot up your Raspberry Pi, giving you a choice of multiple operating systems on your Pi. Now the next project I have for you is a lot of fun and you may have seen it already as it's been in the news quite a bit recently. The Scopy project allows you to take a Raspberry Pi Pico and turn it into a rudimentary two-channel oscilloscope or eight-channel logic analyzer. Now you're going to be using an Android phone or tablet for your display and you're going to need a USB on-the-go or OTG cable in order to connect to the Raspberry Pi but otherwise you hardly need any other components to build this. Now, this is not going to replace a full-fledged oscilloscope or logic analyzer by any means, but it's a great deal of fun, as I said, and it's a worthwhile project. So let's go and see what it takes to turn our Raspberry Pi Pico into an oscilloscope. To construct our Pico oscilloscope, you will, of course, need a Raspberry Pi Pico. You'll also need two 1K resistors and one 100K resistor. The Pico Scope app runs on an Android phone or tablet, and to view it, you're going to need to use the Scopy Android app, which you can get on the Google Play Store. The app itself is free, and you can use the free version, but it's advertiser supported, so if you want to get rid of the ads, you'll have to pay a couple of dollars to get the full version. I'd suggest you try it out with the free version and see if you want to buy the full one. Now let's take a look at how we set up our Pico Oscilloscope. Now the Pico Oscilloscope is made possible by a wonderful Android app called Scopy, and you're going to need to install that onto your Android phone or tablet before you get started. Now there is no equivalent iOS app, so unfortunately you won't be able to use an iPhone or an iPad for this, but hopefully you have an Android device that you can make use of. So go to the Google Play Store and install the Scopy Oscilloscope app. Now it's a free app, but it is advertiser 
are supported. So if you want to get rid of the annoying advertisements on the top, you'll have to buy it. And that's what I actually did. It was only a couple of dollars like most apps. And I think it was well worth it, even though it's not really a full-fledged oscilloscope and logic analyzer. It is a great toy to play with. Now, Scopey themselves have a... Uh, great uh, web page where they give you all the information you'll need about the device, about how to get started with it, how to use the actual app, and even some front-end designs that I'll show you in a little while. Uh, they also have a GitHub page over here where they describe it, and they'll tell you what it is you need to do. And uh, they also go through some troubleshooting techniques, and here's a few images of it as an oscilloscope, and also as its use as a logic analyzer, because it's also a channel logic analyzers as well. The first thing you're going to need to do for our Pico though is you're going to need to uh, download this UF2 file which I've already done and you're going to need to copy that over to the Pico. So let's go over to my download directory and we can see I've got the Scopey Pico uh, V8 uh, UF2 file over here. And so on my Pico you'll notice I've got nothing wired up to it and that's why there wasn't a wiring diagram at the beginning of this. I'm going to hold down the boot cell key and I'm going to insert the micro USB that's connected to my computer and release boot cell. And on my computer now, another drive has appeared. So let's just open up a second pane over here. And in that pane, we can open up that drive. And this is what uh, my Pico is right now. This is a drive created by my Pico. And all I need to do is drag this Scopey app. I can grab it and put it into here and as soon as it goes in that drive will disappear and the way that you know that you're successful is if you look at your Pico now you will see that the onboard LED is this flashing and that indicates that you've done the installation correctly. Our Raspberry Pi Pico oscilloscope has two input channels one on GP26 and one on GP27. Not surprisingly, these are both analog to digital inputs. There's also a 1 kHz square wave available on GP22, and we can use this to perform our first test. Just hook a wire between GP22 and GP26, and we'll feed that 1 kHz wave into channel 1 of the scope. Now we can take a look at that on our Android phone or tablet. All right, so I've got my Pico set up with my jumper wire that should be feeding a one kilohertz signal into the A channel of my little oscilloscope. And I have the Scopey app running right now on my phone. I'm going to plug in the cable and I'm using a USB on the go cable and I have to allow it to have access to it. And uh, we can just hit the run button over here. And there we have it. We have our one kilohertz waveform and we can do things like move it up and down. We can go and change the uh, the vertical and the horizontal just with our fingers or by using the controls on the side over here. And uh, if you stop it, it'll hold the image. So even though I've taken the wire out right now, I'm still getting the image. I'm going to put the wire back in, but I'm going to move it one over. I'm going to run it. And that is now the ground over there, so let's move it back to the 1 kilohertz signal. And there's our 1 kilohertz signal. And so as a rudimentary oscilloscope, it does work actually very well. And so what I want to do next is see what we can do about taking some more complex readings using our Scopey Pico oscilloscope. Now one inherent problem with building a microcontroller based oscilloscope like the Scopey is that the analog to digital converter is used as the input and of course you're limited by the specs of the A to D converter. Now the A to D converter on the Raspberry Pi Pico can measure positive voltages from 0 to 3.3 volts. So you can't measure any negative voltages or any signals higher than 3.3 volts unless you build a front end. And Scopey has provided four different designs for front ends that you might want to build, all of them based around operational amplifiers. 
Each one of these designs is very extensive. They give you a schematic for it. They discuss what it will do. They show you how you can hook it up on a solderless breadboard. And they show you how to calibrate the Scopey device itself for it. And as I said, there are four different designs to choose from, each of them with its inherent advantages and disadvantages. The third one is actually quite a sophisticated design that uses a quad operational amplifier and looks like it would make a fine front end for your Scopey scope. And so if you want to be serious about using this as an oscilloscope, you'll want to build one of these front ends for it. Now if we want to seriously use our Pico oscilloscope, we should build one of the front end circuits that I just showed you. But we can do some simple tests with a couple of resistors. We'll need a 100k resistor and two 1k resistors. We'll start by hooking up Pico pin GP26 to one side of the 100k resistor and the other side of that resistor becomes the input for channel 1 of our scope. We'll hook one of the Pico grounds to one side of one of the 1k resistors and the 3.3 volt output to one side of the other 1k resistor. We'll then tie the other ends of both resistors together and this will become our floating ground input. Now let's go and see how we can use this basic input with our Pico oscilloscope. And so we're using our resistive front end in order to have the floating ground and enable this to measure both positive and negative components. And once again, I've got the Pico hooked up to the Scopey app through the uh, USB OTG cable. And I've got my signal generator over here and uh, currently I'm giving it a sine wave. It's a four kilohertz sine wave. And as you can see, it doesn't actually look that bad. And I can change the frequency on that. And I can use my vertical over here to look at it. And it actually reproduces a sine wave pretty good. I'm actually pretty impressed by this. Uh, let's see if we can give it a couple of other different types of waveforms. Uh, there's a square wave, of course, and we've seen square waves before. And we'll change the waveform over here. Here's a triangle wave. And the triangle wave doesn't look too bad. It's got some pretty nice edges on it, etc. So I would say all in all that this does work as a rudimentary oscilloscope. I'm anxious to actually test it out to see how it works as a logic analyzer. But I'd have to say for the cost of it, which is basically a Raspberry Pi Pico and a very inexpensive or even free app, uh, it's a pretty neat little experiment that you can run. I'm not saying that this will in any way, shape, or form replace a full-fledged oscilloscope, but if you needed an oscilloscope for lower frequencies, let's say for audio frequencies or something, this would actually do the job pretty nicely. And uh, it's a fun experiment to see how you can make an oscilloscope out of a Raspberry Pi Pico. Now, if it isn't obvious by now, I'm very fond of the Raspberry Pi. After all, how many other computers would I throw a birthday party for? But there are a few things about the Raspberry Pi I wish that they would change. One of the things I wish they would change would be at the beginning of the setup procedure where you have to select your country. You get a drop-down list, and by default, it is in the United Kingdom, which is obviously fine because that's where the Pi originates. And if you're in the United States, it's not such a problem because you just drop down one below and you'll get the United States. But I'm in Canada and I need to get to the very top of that list and I need to scroll all the way up there. And it's quite annoying. I mean, the only thing that would be worse would be perhaps living in Angola or Aruba. And I really wish that they would just let you use your keyboard to hit the first letter of the country. So I could hit a C, it would go to Cambodia, and then I could drop down one. So I would love to see that change made to the Raspberry Pi operating system. Another thing I'd love to see the Raspberry Pi have is a power switch. It does not have one. And you can, of course, just unplug the power source or put a switch on that but that's not really a great way of turning off a Raspberry Pi because just yanking the power out without doing a proper shutdown can corrupt your micro SD card. So what I'm going to show you right now is a way that we can add a standby or power switch to the Raspberry Pi. A push button that you can use to put the Pi in the shutdown mode and then press it again to turn it back on and this is a great arrangement especially if you're operating 
putting your Pi in headless mode where you don't actually have a screen or a keyboard on it. So let me go and show you how we can add this functionality to the Raspberry Pi. We can use our Raspberry Pi standby switch project on a Raspberry Pi 4, a Pi 3, or a Pi 0. We'll also need a micro SD card with the Raspberry Pi operating system on it. The only additional component we'll need is the switch itself. This is a push button switch that is normally open and you can use any variety you want. Now here's how we'll wire our switch to the Raspberry Pi. We'll attach one side of our switch to pin 5 on the Raspberry Pi GPIO connector. This is the SCL pin. The other side of the switch can be attached to any of the ground pins on the Raspberry Pi. I used pin 6 as it's right across from pin 5. Now that we have that hooked up, let's take a look at the code we'll need to make our switch work. Now if you check online, you'll find that there are a few scripts available in order to create a shutdown button for your Raspberry Pi. But the one that I liked was this one over here by a user named HowTo that you can find on GitHub. And he's got one called Pi Power Button. Well, technically this isn't a power button because what it's going to do is it's going to do the exact same thing that you would do when you click shutdown on the Raspberry Pi. The Pi is still in a standby mode. It's not completely completely powered off, but once it's shut down, you can pull the power cable safely. Now, I like this one because it uses one button for both powering it off and putting it back on, but one thing that you probably noticed when you saw the schematic is that the button is attached to the SCL pin, and that may concern you because, of course, the SCL pin is the clock pin for the I2C bus, and if you have any I2C peripherals, you might be concerned about them being affected. I don't personally think this is a problem for a couple of reasons, but the main reason is if your I2C devices are slave devices and the Pi is the master, and in most cases that is the case, then you really have nothing to worry about because once you're shutting down the master, the slaves aren't going to be working anyway, and bringing the clock down to ground, which is what you're doing when you press the button, isn't going to hurt anything. It's just the same as a lower clock cycle. Now, if your Pi is a, ras is a slave on the I2C bus, you might want to install some sort of a buffer in between it and the I2C bus just to be on the safe side. And if you're using a 5 volt I2C bus, you have a buffer in there likely anyway. But uh, the more common configuration is for the Pi to be the master and the I2C device is the slave. So this really won't hurt anything. Uh, what you need to do is you need to clone his, uh, his button in with using git in the terminal and so we'll do that we'll just go to our terminal here and we'll paste that in and we'll hit enter and git is built into the operating system assuming you're using a recent raspberry pi operating system if you're using the old raspbian system you had to install it but you really shouldn't be using raspbian anymore the raspberry pi os has been out for a while and all of the experiments i've been doing today use the latest version of the raspberry pi operating system now that we've done this we need to actually do an installation and uh, so let me get my keyboard out here we can do that we can do and we just do that and it's been installed and so now what we can do is we can just give a test to our new power button on the Raspberry Pi okay I've got everything hooked up I've got my power switch or my standby switch rather hooked up to the Raspberry Pi GPIO I've also placed a meter in series with the USB power input and uh, that way we can take a look at the current over here and watch it drop when it goes into standby. It never will go down to zero because it's going to go into standby mode and that is the same thing that happens when you do a shutdown on the Raspberry Pi. Now uh, when we do a shutdown with the Pi you'll always notice there'll be a lot of activity over here on the activity light and that's a way that we can determine as well that this is shut down. So let's go and press the button right now and the activity light is dropped and you'll notice the current is dropped here as well and so now if I press the button again the current starts to rise we can see some activity on the activity light 
and the Raspberry Pi is currently booting up. And there we are, we're on the uh, the Pi screen, we've booted back up and everything. And I just want you to show you that this is basically the same thing as when I do a shutdown on the Pi. So if I go over here, do log out, and then hit shutdown, watch the meter again and the lights. And it's exactly the same thing. It drops down over here to 0.31 of an amp here on standby. At this point, you're safe, of course, to remove the power cable if you want. Or you can press the button again here to get the Pi started. And there we are, and we're booted back up again. So, as you can see, this performs exactly the same function as the shutdown function on the Raspberry Pi. And by pressing the button, we can start it up again. So, this is a really handy feature to have, especially if you're running your Pi in headless mode and don't have a keyboard and monitor on it. It's a great way to shut it down and remove the power on a Raspberry Pi. Now when the good folk at Raspberry Pi decided to build a microcontroller, they didn't just build it around the common MCU chip, they built it around the chip of their own design called the RP2040. And one unique feature of the RP2040 is its PIO or Programmable Input Output feature. Now PIO is like a small little controller built into the microcontroller and it is used basically for manipulating things at a bit level and it can do it with incredible incredibly precise timing, so it's ideal for building custom communication interfaces or interfacing things to video displays. Another thing that PIO is great for is for driving NeoPixels, which are addressable RGB LEDs. Now we have used NeoPixels with the Raspberry Pi Pico before. We did a thing on CircuitPython and used a library from Adafruit to drive a string of NeoPixels, but today we're going to use PIO to drive those NeoPixels. Pixels. So let's go and see how we can take a Raspberry Pi Pico and make a real cool light display to light up our Raspberry Pi party. For this project we'll be using a Raspberry Pi Pico microcontroller. We'll also be using a 16 element NeoPixel ring. Connecting the two devices is very simple. We'll connect the V positive of the NeoPixel ring to the VBUS output on the Raspberry Pi Pico. VBUS is the 5 volt output that comes directly from the USB connector. Now if you decide to use a bigger NeoPixel ring, you'll need to provide it with its own 5 volt power supply, as the 16 pixel ring is about the limits to what you can safely use on the VBUS output. We'll connect the G or ground pin on the NeoPixel ring to one of the grounds on the Raspberry Pi Pico and we'll connect the input of the NeoPixel ring to IO pin GP6 on the Raspberry Pi Pico. Now that we have it connected, let's learn a little bit about programmable input output or PIO devices, because that's how this project is going to work. At the heart of the RP2040 microcontroller that powers the Raspberry Pi Pico, there is a Cortex-M0 processor. This is a two-core processor and handles most of the functions that we commonly use. But there are also two other tiny processors called PIO, or Programmable Input-Output Devices. Each PIO device, in turn, has four different cores, or state machines. These state machines are very simple microcontrollers, in fact they only support nine different functions. However, by using these nine different functions, they can manipulate bits very quickly and they can do it with precision timing. And that's exactly what we need for deriving NeoPixel displays. Each state machine has two FIFO, or first in first out pipes, which accept bits process them, and send them out in the order that they were received. By using this technique, we can offload operations that would normally be performed by bit banging to the PIO devices. This improves the efficiency of the Raspberry Pi RP2040 chip, and is an excellent choice for processing NeoPixel displays. So now let's take a look at some code we can use to drive our NeoPixel ring. 
All right, I've got my Raspberry Pi Pico hooked up to my NeoPixel ring, and I'm also using a separate Raspberry Pi 4, and I'm going to use that in order to run the Thonny IDE, which I'm going to be editing the Python code in. Now, you could use another computer other than the Raspberry Pi 4, but it's quite easy to use a Pi 4 for this, and I thought we could keep it all in the family. Now, I did a video much earlier about using the Raspberry Pi Pico, and if you haven't used it before, before with MicroPython, you might want to check that out. But essentially what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to load MicroPython onto the Pi 4. So I'm going to hold down the boot cell key and connect the micro USB connector to it and release boot cell. And you'll see I've loaded another drive right now. And I'll say OK to open it. And there are two files on there. There's a text file which gives you instructions. And what the instructions are is to basically open the index.htm, which would, of course, open up a web page. And on that web page, you'll get a link to download the latest version of MicroPython. And I've already done that. So I'm just going to grab that and move it into that directory. So it's going to copy over there. And once it copies, the directory will disappear. We can now open up in our programming environment, the Thonny Python IDE. And I've already got it loaded with the code that I want to use today. Now, down at the bottom here, it says I'm connected with MicroPython to the Raspberry Pi Pico. And now, if it doesn't say that, if it just gives you the version of Python that you're using right now, click on it and you'll get a menu and you can select it. But I seem to be in the right place already. And it says so over here. And this over here is my shell. I can type commands directly into it. Now, this is some code that I certainly didn't write myself. It's actually quite complex. And this came directly from Raspberry Pi and they have a PDF about using the PIO and this is one of the examples inside it and this section over here where it starts off over here is the assembly language that is being used for the PIO uh, process and so it's got um, the whole PIO business down over here these are some of the commands that you might notice that we saw earlier when we talked about PIOs and so this is basically doing all the timing for the display, which is called WS2812 because that's the technical name of the LEDs in the uh, in the in the NeoPixel display. And so it's uh, loading that into state machine number zero. It's giving it a frequency and basically piping it in and out of the Python program that follows. Now the Python program that follows does a couple of things like it sets the pixels, shows the pixels, it fills in with colors, etc., and does a color chase. It does a, the position on the wheel it can calculate. And uh, it also defines a cycle for what a rainbow is going to be. And then over here, we define the actual colors we're going to be using. And you could change these around and use a few different colors if you wanted to. And then at the bottom, we're going to actually go and um, we're going to go and go to the wheel. So we will print down here to the shell so we can see what we're doing. And then we're going to fill the colors, show the colors sleep. Over here, we're going to do a chase. We're going to do the color chase and down here, the rainbow. And it should go through all of that and then just stop. And so I'm going to hit the run button right now and see what happens. And it does indeed seem like it's working. and it stops at the very end, and that's great. Now, if we wanted to make this run continuously, what we need to do is we need to give it a continuous loop. So we can go and modify our program a bit. I'm gonna add a line here. I'm gonna hit enter, and now underneath here, I'm gonna move everything one over because of course, Python is based on on tabbing so i'm going to highlight everything and hit my tab key and so i've got now while true it's going to do this and while true is a way to make things run in an infinite loop in python so i'm going to run that now and it's going through the motions 
and gets the rainbow and it goes on again. You can see down here in the bottom of the shell, it's printing out what operation it is doing. And it will continue to do that forever and ever until basically I remove power from it. Now the last thing you might want to do to this is you might want to make it so that whenever you plug it in, it just goes through this. And that's very easy to do. All you have to do is save your program under a different name. And you want to save it under the name of main.py. And if it's saved as main dot py then as soon as the pico is booted up it'll go through the motions and start running all these wonderful colors so if we built about a dozen of these and put them around a room we could really set the party atmosphere for our raspberry pi birthday party Now when you have a brand new computer without an operating system, you will need some form of media to install that operating system and generally you create that media on another computer, be it a USB stick or maybe even a DVD or in the case of the Raspberry Pi, a micro SD card. Well, Raspberry Pi has been experimenting with a new feature that will allow you to install the Raspberry Pi operating system without any pre-formatted media. You'll just connect the Raspberry Pi up to the network, insert a blank micro SD card, and you'll be able to install to that. And it'll also work with USB sticks. Well, we can experiment with this new feature today if we change the bootloader in our Raspberry Pi. Now, this is only going to work with a Pi for, and ironically, although the purpose is to create something where you don't need another machine, you are going to need another machine in order to get the bootloader. But once you've installed it onto your Raspberry Pi 4, you'll be able to install any Raspberry Pi operating system onto a blank micro SD card just by connecting to a network and booting it up. So for our last project today, let's go and take a look at the Raspberry Pi network boot feature. Our Pi network operating system installation will only work on a Raspberry Pi 4. In addition, you will require two micro SD cards, one for the bootloader update and another blank FAT32 formatted card to install your operating system on. You can use one card if you wish for the bootloader and then reformat it with FAT32 and use it again for the operating system. We'll be performing a network installation of the Raspberry Pi operating system. In order to do this, we need to upgrade the bootloader on the Raspberry Pi to a new experimental version. For this to work, you'll also require an Ethernet connection. So now let's see how we can upload our Raspberry Pi bootloader and perform our network operating system installation. Now, ironically, although this is intended to be a method of not needing an external computer in order to install a Raspberry Pi operating system, we do need an external computer because what we need to do is we need to update the bootloader that is burned into the Raspberry Pi. And the only way of doing that is to provide a new bootloader on a micro SD card. And in order to make that bootloader, we need to use the Raspberry Pi imager. Now, this, of course, is a temporary situation and eventually Raspberry Pi will be releasing new models of the board with an updated bootloader and you won't have to go through this step, but for now we do. So I've got a micro SD card inserted into my computer and I've opened up the imager. I need to go and choose the operating system and we get the normal screen. We're going to scroll down on this screen right now to miscellaneous utility images and we'll click on that. And we've got a bootloader where you can restore the original bootloader for the Raspberry Pi or we have a beta test bootloader and so we've got that over here and we're going to check out that we're going to go into beta test bootloader and go down to network boot and that's what we want and then we're going to choose our storage and the storage of course is the generic device I've added into here and we'll hit write and we get the usual message we'll continue now this doesn't take a great deal of time this is much quicker than burning a whole Raspberry Pi operating system and verifying it And now we've installed the bootloader software onto the micro SD card. We can go and pop that into our Raspberry Pi. And it is indeed the last time we'll need to use this computer because now we'll be able to upload the bootloader in order to do a network install of the operating system. 
So now that I have my new bootloader image on a micro SD card, I've put the micro SD card into the Raspberry Pi and what we're going to do is power it up and that should transfer that image into the EEPROM on the Raspberry Pi. Now when I do this, I want you to take a look at this activity light. It's the second LED over where you can see ACT upside down here right now. And this is the indication that the bootloading process is complete. It happens very quickly because it's not a lot of data. So what you're going to see is a rapid flashing and then a steady pulse. And when you've got the steady pulse, you know you're done. Also, if you happen to have a monitor hooked up to your Raspberry Pi, then the monitor will turn completely green and that will indicate that you're finished the process. So let me just plug the power in over here. And there, we're seeing it go very quickly, and now we're seeing a steady pulse. And the steady pulse is the indication that we have finished the bootloader process. It was very quick, and so now we can unplug the power cable, and we can remove the micro SD card and go on to the next step. All right, so I'm now booting up the Raspberry Pi with a blank micro SD card. Actually, what I did is I took the micro SD card that I used for my bootloader and I reformatted it with FAT32. And so right now it is attempting to do a network boot and you'll see a bunch of information up on the screen. And now we get to this screen that says to install the Raspberry Pi OS using the Raspberry Pi image. And what you need to do is press and hold the shift key down to start the installation. So I'm going to do that. And now it is installing the Raspberry Pi image. And again, this does take a little while to do. You definitely want to be doing this using an Ethernet cable. In fact, you have no choice at the moment because you simply haven't been able to give it any Wi-Fi parameters. So make certain that you've got an Ethernet cable on your Raspberry Pi. And now we are at the familiar screen of the Raspberry Pi Imager and we can go through it and uh, make our selections. And we can also do a couple of things down at the bottom. We could change our keyboard and our language if we wanted to. I think I better put that back to English for myself. Uh, keyboard type as well. And otherwise it's the exact same imager that we're used to using. We can choose our operating system that we wish to install. Uh, when we choose the storage, the storage that's going to come up is the internal SD card reader, but if you had a USB stick in there, it would also come up as a potential storage device. And we just go through the same motions to install an operating system that we did when we use the imager on a second computer. So this is a wonderful feature. And as I said, it's in beta right now, and that's why we had to uh, install our own bootloader, so we did need another computer. But once the bootloader in the Raspberry Pi has been installed with this, uh, you can install new operating systems at any point that you want without uh, the need for a second computer. Just put a blank micro SD that's formatted at FAT32 into your drive and uh, away you go. So this is a great feature coming up for the Raspberry Pi. Well, it's been quite a party and I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you actually watch this video in one sitting, well, you're really to be commended. But even if you just skipped over to the projects that interest you, I hope you found them enjoyable and I hope they've inspired you to build some new things with your Raspberry Pi. Now, if you want more information on any of these projects, just head over to the DroneBotWorkshop.com website where you will find not just one article today, but 11, yes, 11 articles. And article about the history of the Raspberry Pi plus an individual article for each one of these projects and those articles have all the links all the software that you need in order to get the projects built while you're on the website if you haven't yet please consider subscribing to my newsletter it's not a sales letter and it certainly isn't a spam letter it's just my way of letting you know what goes on in the workshop and all I need from you is your email address and also if you would like to discuss 
discuss more things about the Raspberry Pi, maybe show off some of your Raspberry Pi projects, or if you're having some difficulty getting something to work, head over to the DroneBot Workshop Forum where you'll find a number of other Raspberry Pi enthusiasts who would love to help you out. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. I really love getting new subscribers. All you need to do is hit that red subscribe button and also click on that bell notification. And as long as you've got your notifications enabled on YouTube, you'll get notified every time that I make a new video. And it probably won't be as long as this video. So until we meet the next time, please take care of yourself. Please stay safe. Enjoy the Raspberry Pi birthday party. And I will see you soon here in the workshop. Goodbye for now.